that worldview. The author is telling you, I'm writing you an allegory or a story. You see, this the same thing is true in Tobit. The same thing is true in Estrus, in parts of, in, in some of Estrus. The same thing is true in other some of the other documents that we're going to see. This is really important to note because does this destroy the validity of the document? No. It destroys its validity as his history, right? You wouldn't trust it for its history, per se. You'd look at it like you would Charles Dickens. Anybody like to read Charles Dickens? Oliver Twist, right? I love that stuff. The history, though, in that document, in Charles Dickens' writing, isn't specifically because he's writing an historical fiction novel, because he's not. He's writing a novel about his times, and many of his novels include historical information, whether it's right or wrong. You see? <laughs> Many of it's fiction. So, you see this. So what can we learn from Judah? We can learn how the people lived at the time, how they thought at the time, but not necessarily good history at the time. It makes it a great document, and um, okay, here's, here's the kind of from a standpoint of a Jewish or Christian standpoint. If the rabbis, if somebody wrote this to be a Dirash text, and we know that rabbis wrote this because Septuagint, right? So what did they intend? They intended for this to be a message to people on a doctrinal or a theological basis, right? An encouragement of some kind. That kind of puts it in a different lead, doesn't it? In any case, Judith may be a recitation of an earlier piece of Hebrew legend, just like, for example, Homer's Odyssey and Iliad. It took a long time for them to finally write down the Odyssey and the Iliad, right? Homer finally wrote, wrote them down. But they were known to be um, literature, or not literature, uh, verbal, uh, songs, so poems, songs that had been passed down by the, what do you call it, bard scalds, uh, um, there's another word I'm looking for. Anyway, by those who who had who were the uh, poets in the Greek culture and Greek society, and so finally someone was able to write down Judith. That's very possible. I think mean, that's probably the best, probably the way it came about. Um, and you know what? I have a whole bunch of things from Judith. Let me just start with a little bit uh, because we'll skip over all the rest. Uh, we don't have time. We're gonna have we have to go to the wisdom literature. But in any case, this is what it starts, how it starts. In the 12th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, and by the way, that's, uh, this is, comes from an old translation that I found on the net, on the web. So in any case, who reigned in Nineveh, and remember, Nebuchadnezzar didn't reign in Nineveh. He was not a Syrian. The great city in the days of uh, Arpak said, which reigned over the Medes in Ecbatana, and built an ecbatana walls round about stones hewn three cubits broad, six cubits long, made the height of the wall 70 uh, cubits, and the breadth thereof uh, 50 cubits. That's what I was saying. The, the size of the walls are, you know, we don't find that archaeologically. Uh, set towers, etc., etc. So this is just in information right from the beginning. Um, I can't go over all the texts that I have because these are some really neat things, but basically she. She, oh, let me see, do I have the prayer? The prayer is really good. The prayer of before she croaks. In any case, um, she convinces them she'll go out and she'll, she'll basically take care of the problem. Uh, she basically seduces him and gets him drunk and then lops his head off. And when, just before she lops her, his head off, she... Praise. And that's what's so interesting. Okay, let's see, is this it? <coughs> okay. Now Judith commanded her maid to stand without the bedchamber and to wait for her coming forth, as she did daily. So she would go into this guy daily. For she said she would go forth to her prayers, and she spake to uh, Bagus as one of his, um, uh, I can't remember if he's a general or if he's a helper, according to the same purpose. So they all went forth, and none was 
left in the bedchamber, neither little or great. Then Judah, standing by his bed, said to in her heart, O God of all power, look at this, at this present upon the works of my hands for the exaltation of Jerusalem. And notice two things. Number one, she is doing individual prayer. This is a very New Testament idea. This is not an Old Testament idea. Number two, she's doing it silently. This is also very odd. In Old Testament culture, you never prayed silently. Remember, in New Testament culture, you rarely prayed silently. Probably a good idea if you're standing beside the guy you're going to croak. But in any case, um, she's praying. And look at her prayer. She said in her heart, O oh Lord of God of all power, look at this present upon the works of my hands for the exaltation of Jerusalem. She's praying for what she is going to do. That is very odd also. Because most prayers are not like that in the Old Testament. Most prayers, and I, and I uh, in other classes I've taught, I've given comparisons of the prayers from the Old Testament to New Testament. Go look at Old Testament prayers. They're very general. Many times they're, you know, get rid of my enemies, but very general about who your enemies are. Or help me, but very general about what your help is. She's praying about something very specific. Just like Samuel's mother prayed for a child. See? That's an odd Old Testament prayer. She's praying that she would be able to kill this guy. For now is the time to help thine inheritance and to execute thine enterprises to the destruction of the enemies which are risen against us. Then she came to the pillow of the bed, which was at, uh, uh, this is the king, Holofenius, he's the, that's the general, head, and took down his uh, foshan. A foshan is a, is a, is, that's a French word. It's a big axe-like sword. The foshan from this. And approached to his bed and took hold of the hair of his head and said, Strengthen me, O Lord God of Israel, this day. Another prayer. And she smote twice upon his neck with all her might. And she took away his head from him and tumbled his body down from the bed and pulled down the canopy from the pillars. And now and after she went forth, she gave Holofernes' head to her maid. And, <laughs> she, and she put it in the bag of meat. <laughs> I love it. So they twain went together according to their custom in the prayer, and they passed the camp. They could pa uh, there's a lot that goes on in this story. It's a really neat story. And so she went to the gates and showed the head, and she was exalted in all of Israel because she had defeated this general. Now, I don't have time to go through all this. So, I, I, there are no illusions. I don't No, There are illusions. I got the illusions. I put them in the wrong place. I should have put them right after Judith. But the illusions to, to in the New Testament to Judith are, are, we'll see them later. I won't go through all of them. Um, let's talk about the additions to Esther. Sorry, I've cut this up. I've done it better in the other, in the next one a little bit. But the additions to Esther, these consist of six long paragraphs that are ins in inserted in the Septuagint version of Esther in several places. They're thought to be the work of an Egyptian Jew writing around 170 BC. Uh, Egyptian Jew means he's Greek, right? Hellenized, because that's the, the Jews or the Greeks controlled this area from about, what, 300 um, BC? So in any case, they controlled Egypt. They're designed to provide the book with a more religious tone to make it clear that it was for the sake of their piety that the Jews were delivered from the evil designs of the Gentiles related in the canonical book. Now that is, uh, that is a view of, that's a generalized view. That's not necessarily my view. Okay, I'm presenting you a lot of different ideas and views. Uh, the additions were put at the end of the book by Jerome when he made his Latin translation because he accepted only the Hebrew text as canonical. And then later, I've told you the history of how it got moved to the center mostly by Martin Luther and then later other Protestant groups. So, what about Esther? What about these additions? These additions are generally about God, letters, and details of a great thought. These are very, very similar to the additions that we find in Ezra and Nehemiah, Estrus. What if these editions aren't editions at all? What if the canonical do documents remove these? Remember what I told you about Ezra and Nehemiah? 
what would you reduce a document? Let's say you have a document, and the document is accurate. And the document has a bunch of letters and has a lot of pious stuff about Jehovah in it. But you want to sell this document to pagans in Babylon or pagans in Egypt. What would you pull out? Let's pull out the boring stuff. Let's pull out the letters. Let's pull out that pious stuff. Let's pull out that Jewish God stuff, right? You notice that your version of Esther, the canonical version of Esther in the Old Testament, doesn't have what? Doesn't have the God stuff, doesn't have the boring stuff, and doesn't have the letters. Which is right. I mean, I could argue as a scholar that the Septuagint version might be the more accurate version. It gives you more information about Esther. Ladies, fight for your books. Make them give it back. There's nothing negative in it, you know, at all. It's just additions. But I've got the additions here, but I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm not going to, you know, um, it's just there are prayers in there. There are things about Jehovah God in there. There are the letters in there. Um, I've got all of them. Chapter 10, chapter 11 has a little bit of ads. Chapter 12 has some ads. 13 has some ads. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these up on my website, all the slides, and if you want to go through all the editions, you can do that. Yes, sir. You would think that the more logical explanation would be that they would pull something out that was already written than to get a book and then say, oh, I'm just going to add some stuff to this. Right. I, you know, and think about this. I have not gone through the, the Hebrew historical veracity thing in this class. Uh, there, there was a need for it. Most of you have heard it, and even if you haven't, um, you know, for the apocryphal documents, it's not as powerful an argument as it is for the Hebraic documents. But in any case, from what we know about Hebraic thought and Hebraic documents, how important is it to them to not mess with the documents? It's very important, isn't it? I mean, it's a critical factor. That even today, when they copy the Torah and the scrolls, that they are copied exactly. So, you know, the fact that we find additions to these documents is a, is a question. Because it's more likely that you would find, it's more likely that you would find in popular, the popular documents, those that had removed those parts, as I mentioned that were boring or had God stuff in it or whatever to make it more palatable to the Gentile audience that they, that they might find the documents in. And also, Lionel, when uh, is the style of the language different from the main body in the editions, or, the, or is it very similar, very close? It flows, and it's... Um, you would think then, you would think then that if somebody were going to take a that, that the original author would not come up and say, now I'm going to add to my original document. You would say it would be another person that would do that. And if right. they did it, then probably their style would not be quite the same. And if you notice, remember I told you that in Judith we see evidence of Hellenization in Judith? We don't find so much evidence of Hellenization in the additions to Esther. Yes, sir. I'm reading the Torah and the Apocrypha at the same time. It seems to me the Apocrypha language is more modern, more like current English. Is that true, and is it because they were hot in Greek instead of Hebrew? No, it depends, on, it depends on your translation, but what tended to happen is this. And what you'll find is most of the Apocryphal documents read just a little bit different than Old Testament, maybe closer to New Testament documents. The reason for that is twofold. Number one, I haven't taught in this venue about translations, but I have a whole class that I teach about translations and about different types of translations. New Testament and Old Testament documents tend to be very constrained translations. Very constrained. You know why, right? You can guess why. 